few hours later, I learned a lot about how navigating works on the ship like this. Though learning and understanding weren't the same thing. By the time I finished trying to help Sunspot and Elliot with the ship and navigation, they both wanted to throw me over the side of the ship. Thank the goddesses, Sunspot and Elliot were both too kind to do it. I was now back in Sunspot's room with her. She was settling down to sleep and pulled one of the memory orbs from my uncle's box out. This one I knew had it along the Night Stalker. I could tell by how the slight green or gray glow of them worked. This one caught my eye almost at once when I saw the note under it that said, Former Headquarters of the Children. I still can't find a way to open the door. This memory orb's a bust. Unless I can find a passcode that I need. Keeping this one just in case I need it later. I found myself looking at the shimmering orb, trying to work up the courage to go inside of it. As I looked down, I asked Sunspot, So why does Captain Gunny call himself a sky pirate? From what I can tell, all you three do is trade with other ponies. Most of the time. But when we get a chance now and then, we go after Enclave ponies or raiders and take them for everything they have. That's how Gunny makes most of his caps. Like that power armor we stole from the dead Pegasi. And a few other things inside that downed wrapper from earlier. You'd be surprised how much you can make with Enclave stuff being sold to the right buyer. Gunny has a contract in most major settlements across the wasteland, she said, laying down and looking at me from her pillow. Why do you do it? The Enclave's a big enemy to make, isn't it? I asked. Sure is, but I'm sure you can tell by how Gunny isn't scared of anything. I don't think he's capable of it. As far as we do it, well, Gunny hates the Enclave more than most ponies. Something to do with his dead wife, I think. He's never told me the whole story. But I do know that she was a rogue pegasus from a smaller settlement near Thunderhead, she said. Oh, so his wife was killed by them, I guess? I said. He thinks so. No pony knows for sure, really. He says that she was taken away one night when we were near San Francisco. He hasn't seen her since. As far as he knows, she's dead, and he's been going after the Enclave ever since. He thinks they found her one night and took her. Sunspot said, rolling onto her back and looking up at the ceiling. No wonder he's lost his marbles. He must have loved her a lot, I said, frowning. She just shrugged. From what I hear, he's always been like that. I've only known him for a few months. He takes some getting used to, but all in all, he's a good pony. I smiled at that. Yeah, I can see that. So are you going to stare in that orb all night? She asked. I think so. I'm just worried something's going to happen while I'm in the orb. I replied. Don't worry. I'm here, and I'll keep an eye on you. If something does happen, I'm not going to leave you behind. She said with a smile. Okay, but you can try and sleep while I'm in it. I don't know how long it'll take. I said. No problem with me. She said, rolling over again. I took a deep breath and concentrated my magic on the orb. Like one of the other orbs I found of Night Stalker, this one was protected. His voice echoed into my head when the connection was made. Who is the only one I ever trusted? As soon as the question was out, I felt something cut off my airway. I gagged as I felt my throat close up. Only a little air was able to make it out as the orb slowly started to kill me. I almost panicked, but something inside refused to let me. Concentrating with all my power, I said in my head, Greta Blood Talon. The pressure got worse, and I started to gag more. Sunspot was on her paws, coming over to me to see what was wrong. My eyes bulged and my tongue stuck out as I tried desperately to pull air into my lungs. How could that answer be wrong? Night Stalker never trusted anyone apart from Greta. That's why he was so surprised when she left him. Who else could he have trusted apart from? Shadow? What's wrong? Sunspot said, but I ignored her as the answer hit me. I thought desperately. No pony but yourself. The pressure vanished in an instant as Night Stalker's voice echoed in my head. The only pony who can be trusted with everything you hold dear is yourself. The world melted away. What the hell kind of crazy lock was on that memory orb? 
I knew Night Stalker was paranoid, but holy shit, that was crazy. How the hell had he even done that? It was a fucking pegasi, not a unicorn. To be honest, I was starting to wonder why I kept finding so many of his orbs. It was like they were drawn to me or something. Either that, or I was the luckiest pony in the wasteland, or the unluckiest, depending on how you looked at it. Either way, I found myself now in the body of none other than Night Stalker himself, and he was in the Crystal Empire. This had to be many years after the Mega Spells, because in the distance I could see the shimmering barrier and the black wall of Smoky Death. Night Stalker's body felt like crap, too. Every joint seemed to be on fire. His vision was fading a little, and I could feel a stinging pain on his flanks, right where his cutie mark should have been. Still, even with the pain in his limbs and on his flanks, he moved like he didn't even feel it. He was wearing a cloak of some kind. I could feel, through him, that something was pushing on his chest with a cloak clasped together. The old Pegasus moved down the streets of the Crystal Empire, doing his best to move around the small crowd of ponies. The odd thing was that no pony seemed to look at him, as if he was invisible. Maybe he was using a stealth buck or something like that? I couldn't tell, but still he moved down the road, heading for a small building not far from the palace. Instead of walking in through the front door, he made his way around to the back, passing through a small alleyway. Once he was there, he moved to the back door and pulled out a small green gem and pressed it into the lock. The gem looked to be like it was hovering in midair when he used it. The gem flashed, and a moment later, I could hear a click. After putting the gem back into his pocket, he slowly opened the door. My host took a moment to look around inside before slipping through. He quietly shut the door behind him and locked it again. He moved through the dimly lit room, which looked like some kind of lab, and made his way to another door. And this door was open slightly, and voices could be heard coming through the crack. Night Stalker moved an eye up to the crack and looked out at two stallions who were talking. One was a very short unicorn stallion who could barely see over the counter he was standing behind. He had a bright blue mane with a violet coat and a bright pair of green eyes. His cutie mark was just visible under his lab coat, a six-pointed blue and white star with a zebra glyph in the center. He was talking to a Pegasus who was just as tall and big as Night Stalker. His eyes were a bright green, his mane a mix of gold and black, and his coat was a grayish blue color. He had a nasty scar right along his muzzle. I couldn't make out his cutie mark because it was military uniform. He looked like the conversation he was having with the short unicorn was making him angry. Listen to me, Dark Star. I know you have your mother's notes and her old spell books. The Enclave needs them before my father decides to pay the Crystal Empire a visit and takes them for himself, the tall Pegasus said in a deep growling voice. Dwarf Star, the short unicorn, was my distant grandfather. I guess the short stature did run in the family. He was close to the same height as me. Poor Buck. At least me being a mare, it wasn't so bad being short. For a stallion, it had to be a hard life when you were young. My grandfather cleared his throat and spoke in a kind and gentle voice. I've told you before, Night Rain, I don't have access to them. I never have. Minette and Amethyst Star hid those things in the library. A library that no pony knows where it is. I don't know if Night Stalker knows where it's at. But I was only a foal when my parents died, and they didn't leave me anything to find the location. Night Rain slammed his hoof down on the counter, shouting, I don't believe you, Dwarf Star. I know that you have information on falling shadows. You've been looking into that old project for 20 years now, and you mean to tell me that you haven't found out where your disgrace of a mother left her fucking notes? I saw a flash of gray light around Dwarf Star's horn for a moment as his eyes flared with anger. Then he calmed himself down, saying, I have looked into that project because High Council, Council Pony Thunderlane asked me to many years ago, wanting to know why the project was locked down. With the loss of such much intel when the Mega Spells hit, it's been a hard journey. I told the same dear little sister, Nightingale, last week. Thunderlane wants that information, and he knows you have it, Night Rain said. Then he's wrong. If the High Council Pony wants to find the information on a project, 
he helped make, then he should look into it himself. He worked with both of my mothers. He should know more than I do, Dorfstar said, sounding bored. Now, if that's all you came here for, then please leave my lab. Night Rain pointed a hoof into Dwarfstar's face. I am a captain of the Grand Pegasus Enclave, special military force. You can't kick me out. And I'm the most powerful unicorn in the Enclave, and the head of the city council, also the head of the science department, and a well-respected citizen of the Crystal Empire. You have no power over me here, Night Rain. Now get out of my shop. And if any of your family wants to come back here, then it had better be your mother or your sister. Because I don't feel like talking to either of you or your brother anymore. You disgust me. To think you two had the balls to kill your eldest brother only because he defended your father, Dwarfstar said. Watch your tone with me, Dwarfstar, Night Rain shouted. No, I don't think I will, Dwarfstar said, his horn flashing. A moment later, Night Rain was lifted into the air. Don't come back to my lab again. If you do, our conversation will end with you as a pile of ash. And with that, he blasted Night Rain out the front door. Night Rain slammed onto the road and rolled a few feet before coming to a stop. He picked himself up, looking like he wanted to go back in and kill the small unicorn. But he must have thought better of it, because he opened his wings and flew away. Night Stalker waited a moment making sure Night Rain was gone before opening the door from the back room and walking into the front. Dwarf Star looked over at the door, and a small smile came to his lips as Night Stalker pulled down his hood, and my body came into view. I guess the cloak he had on was what was making him invisible. Dwarf Star looked at my host up and down, saying, Where'd you get a zebra stealth cloak, Knight? Night Stalker cut him off. Don't use my name here, Dwarf Star. There's no telling if my son left a bug behind. Dwarf Star's horn flashed, and a gray light flew all over the room. He shrugged, saying, Nothing I can find. I felt Night Stalker's body relax a little, as he said. Good, but I'm still not going by that name anymore. Then what should I call you? Dwarf Star asked as he walked over to the door at his lab and closed it. Absent Moon will do. I haven't used that name in over 45 years. The ponies who knew me by that name are dead now. So I'm not worried about using it. As for the stealth cloak, let's just say an old zebra friend of mine gave it to me a couple weeks back. Nice stalker said as he looked around the small laboratory. I'll just believe that you killed a zebra to get it, Dwarfstar said. Either you're testing me, or you really haven't kept up with your mother's research over the years that I've heard. Because if you try to steal a cloak from this, from a zebra, even by killing them, the cloak turns into black mist. The Night Stalker said as he went over to a small picture standing behind the counter. It was a picture of Amethyst Star and Minette. Min was holding a bundle under her hooves, lying in a hospital bed, both looking happy. I was testing you, Dwarfstar said, walking over to stand next to my host. I remember this day well. Min wanted so bad to be a mother. The day she decided to get pregnant was the happiest day of her life. Strange, though, that you'd have this picture of your mom's and not others. I know they took a lot with you before... Well, you know, Night Stalker said. It was the only one the ponies who raised me had. I found a few of Manette and Amethyst together, or separate, but none of them with me. When my mother gave me to the ponies who raised me, I don't think she was thinking much about me remembering her. Honestly, I don't think she cared, he said. My host looked over and down at the small stallion. She cared. She cared a lot. But losing your mother... Other mother broke something inside of her. She didn't know what to do with herself once Amethyst died. She started working against the children and the ministries towards the end. She even tried to kill me before she up and vanished. Giving you up, I think, was her way of making sure you didn't fall into her madness. He sighed and turned away from the picture. So tell me, Absent, 
what are you doing here? I host took another minute to look at the picture of his old friend before saying, I know what you told my son about not knowing where men's notes and research were, but I know that's a lie. Even if it was, it doesn't mean I'm going to give it to you, absent. The only reason I said you could meet with me today is because you said you had information for me about my mom, and that's all, he said. Night Stalker laughed. I don't need her notes or anything like that. I know everything about Fallen Shadows. I even know where the notes are kept and everything of Min's, even her grimoire. If you needed them, I would have just gone to the other library and taken them. Then why bring them up? And why are you even here? He asked, sounding suspicious. I want you to do everything you can to hide those notes and her grimoire. Make sure there are more spells around that entrance to the library, and start spreading rumors about the notes being lost. Anything you can to make ponies forget about the project and who started it, my host said. Dwarfstar looked at my host curiously. Out of all the ponies, I thought you'd be the first to want to know more about what happened to the project. From what I've learned over the years, you've been trying to find a way to unlock your own project so you can make use of it. And that was true. Until a few months ago, Night Stalker said with a deep sigh. I've learned something about what my project was truly meant to do, and because of that I can't let any pony use it. So I've decided to make sure that no pony can. I've set things up, and I'm getting close to finishing what I have to do. But before I can, I need a pony like you to help me. I've always figured Falling Shadows was some kind of weapon. What's new about that? He said. My host sighed again, then looked towards the door of his lab. Let's go into your lab, and I'll explain things there. Sure, Dwarfstar said, leading the way. Once they were in the small lab, and Dwarfstar turned on the lights, Night Stalker said, It was never meant to be a weapon itself. Its true purpose was to turn Princess Luna into Nightmare Moon again, only with full control of her mind. If that's true, then how can any pony else use it? Princess Luna died forty years ago. Dwarfstar said. Minette said that same thing can be done to another pony who's on the verge of being very powerful enough to survive the transfer of power. It'd be hard because they would have to let something very powerful into their mind and body to do it and activate the project. If they can win the fight against this being, they would be the most powerful pony in history. But if the battle was to be lost, then that creature would take the power for itself. But that's not what the project makes scary, Night Stalker said. From what I can tell, that's plenty scary, Dwarfstar replied. True enough. But it's nothing compared to what will truly happen if the project is used. You see, the power it would take to make a pony into a powerhouse like Nightmare Moon could and will open a rift into places more like Tartarus. If that happens, then something dark and powerful will get free, and our world will be doomed, more than it already is. His power would make the war look like a fight in a bar, he said. Dwarfstar paled at that. You can't be serious. I am, and that's why I want to make sure no pony can ever use it. Night Stalker said. What could be that powerful? He asked. I can't tell you everything about him. Honestly, I don't know much about myself. But an old zebra that lives with my friend told me about him. If you want to know more, then you'll have to research him yourself. His name is Mezzanote. Night Stalker said. Dwarf Star started to tap his lower jaw and thought. Sound zebra to me? Or old zebra. I think it means midnight. Well, if you think he's that scary, then I guess I have no choice but to help you, Absent. But I'm not sure what I can do apart from hide some notes and cast a few spells. First, you won't be helping me as much as my daughter. Her name is Nightingale. She's going to be coming to the Crystal Empire soon with her foal. She's taking on my zebra friend's old role as guardian. She'll tell you what she'll need to help us. As for me, 
All I need you to do is help me make some memory orbs, Night Stalker said. Why memory orbs? Also, what kind of spell do you want me to use if I do it? Some will just copy the memory, others will remove the memory from your head, and some can only block out the memory, he said. I need you to make the orbs because one day a descendant of mine will need them. Don't ask me how I know this, but trust me, she's going to need all the help she can get, and I have to make sure she gets it, my host said. So you can see into the future now, is that it? Dorfstar asked, sounding like he thought Night Stalker had lost his mind. No, but something else can. He was the one who told me what would happen, and what I would need to stop it. Even then, where what we're doing today will only slow down the events until she's born, Night Stalker said. And then in a quieter voice, he said, She will also end the curse. Dwarfstar rolled his eyes. And that stupid curse? I can't believe you of all ponies still believe in that kind of thing. Trust me, one day you will too, Dwarfstar, my host said, sounding sad and angry at the same time. I don't think I will. Let's say that I believe you. How do you know that this, her, can stop falling shadows? Or this curse? Dwarfstar asked. For falling shadows, I don't know. Even the thing that told me what I needed to do wasn't entirely sure it would go the way that he hoped. But it's my best chance, Night Stalker said. Dwarfstar rolled his eyes again. Okay, fine, and the curse? Night Stalker took a deep breath and recited. Hooves of fate, tales of woe. The sights of your future are full of a dangerous foe. When the ponies of night fall at last, the mare who will rise off a deadly cast. Her power will be great, but her path will be cold. When the pony of shadows and light falls to the might, she will rise again with the purest of light. She will find the descendants of the night's past and bring them to be the last. She will defeat the last of the betrayer's seeds and break the curse out of great need. Once this is done, the curse will be gone, and the family of night can continue to live on. Dwarfstar blinked a couple of times. So you're writing songs now, Absent? How does any of that make sense? Did you visit some crazy zebra or something? I didn't write anything, Dwarf Star. I heard that many years ago when I was in Las Pegasus. I heard it from the same old zebra a few weeks ago. She hadn't aged a day in all that time. She told me about a descendant of mine and yours that will one day break this curse. She will find the descendant of the one who betrayed the children of the night and kill them but only after she brings the descendants of the Children of the Night together again. That is to say, the descendants of the ones who were true to Luna and Equestria, that is, Night Stalker said. And it has to happen after all of us are already dead. And this rhyme, or song, or whatever it is, is just that. A bunch of words that sound pretty when recited. Besides, you don't have proof it's even real. I think this zebra of yours is crazy and... You are too, Dwarfstar said. But I do know that my mother really believed in the same curse, so I guess I can see where you're coming from. I'm not going to like it, but I'll help you. Good. I'd like to start now, if that's all right. All of the memories I tell you to copy, I want you to, but leave them intact in my head. All but one, Night Stalker said. Dwarfstar shrugged. I can do that. Which memory is it you need removed? Night Stalker stiffened a little, as he said. On the day the mega spells came, I was at the Children of the Night's old base. I had two items I was hiding there from Minette, just in case she showed up again. We weren't using the base anymore, so I knew she wouldn't look for them there. One was a memory crystal that belonged to a member of Luna's old guards, the first Children of the Night. It has something on it that can be useful in understanding what falling shadows can truly do. The other item is something I can't tell you about. 
but it will be needed to stop Stargazer. It's deadly to the creature who is part of that project, but only if a unicorn of great power uses it. I'm guessing you want me to take the memory orb coming here out too, then, huh? Dwarfstar said. You'll need to copy this one too, but block part of this memory from me, just in case I run into a unicorn who can use the memory from today. I'll also need you to lock the memory orbs with different questions to make sure they're safe. Night Stalker said. Dwarfstar sighed. All right. But it's going to take a long time. I hope you're ready. I am, Night Stalker said. Okay, then. Let's start with that memory of when Equestria died, Dwarfstar said, his horn glowing. I came out of the memory orb slowly. When I did, I looked down at the shining glass ball. My brain couldn't even comprehend what he said in the orb. Somehow, some way, my great-great-something or whatever great-grandfather knew what was going to happen. He knew about me and what I was going to need so I could stop falling shadows. He also had something that could stop Stargazer. Something that was deadly to Aquila. He also said something about a pony named... Mezzanote? I know I've heard that name somewhere before, but I couldn't put my hoof on it. Whoever, or whatever he was, he was powerful and part of Falling Shadows. And to top it all off, he thought I was the mayor who could stop this curse on our family. I was going to find the descendants of the Children of the Night. As far as I knew, I was the only one I knew about were me, Mom, Uncle Ori, Stryker, Dad, or and her sisters. Also Winter Frost and his sister. Not only did I have to find the rest of the descendants, if there were any more, I'd also have to kill one or more of them if they were the ones who betrayed the Children of the Night. What if it was one of my friends? How could I even think about doing something like that? Right now, the only thing I could do was worry about getting back to my friends. Once I was with them, I could talk it all over with them. Then something else came to me. I needed to get to the old base in Canterlot. Whatever was left there was something I needed. So I got up and shook Shunspot, who fell asleep while I was in the orb. She rolled over and looked me in the face. Oh, what's wrong, Shadow? We need to go to Canterlot, I said. What? She jumped out of her bed. Are you nuts? Do you know what that city's like? No, I've never read much about it since I left my stable. Why? I asked. Canterlot is deadly to go into. It's covered in a pink cloud that'll turn you either into a ghoul, unlike anything you've seen before, or it'll fuse you with the ground and the buildings around you, she replied. Gunny showed it to us a few months back or so. There's no way you can go there. It doesn't matter. I have to go there. If I don't, it might spell doom for the wasteland, I said. Doomin' and gloomin' be Captain Gunny's middle name, Gunny said as he opened the door to our room. Me sorry, ladies, or whatever, but Gunny couldn't help overhearin' ya from the room yonder. Captain, she's crazy if she thinks she can go to Canterlot, Sunspot said. Maybe she be, or maybe she don't be. Be dependent upon the place of the pointy pink cloud city she be needin' to go. Gunny said with a laugh. The entrance to the old base of the Children of the Night. It's located in the tallest cliff overlooking the city, I said, wondering how bad this so-called pink cloud could really be. Wait, you just need to get to the top of the tallest cliff, not into the city itself? Sunspot asked, sounding less scared. Yeah, I replied. Aye. Then Captain Gunny might be able to help you. As long as you don't need to be going into the old pinky cloud of creepiness, then you should be okay. Though you can't stay for too long. Captain Gunny had alicorns be spotted there not long ago, Gunny said. I'll be in and out, I said. Gunny took a moment to think. It looked hard. Then he finally said with a mighty laugh, and that adventure would be awaiting it be. Maybe Gunny and his crew be finding some good lootin' while we're there. 
Captain, I still think it's a bad idea. You know how dangerous the area even around Canterlot is, Sunspot said. Aye, but Gunny also likes an adventure and caps, Gunny said with a mad smile. First mate, head topside and be changing our course for Canterlot. Sir, Sunspot said. All Captain Gunny be wanting to hear out of ye is a proper aye aye, Gunny said. She sighed and said, Aye aye, Captain. That be the spirit lass. Now be off with ye, he said. Thanks, Captain Gunny. This means a lot to me, I said as Sunspot headed out of the room. He waited a moment for her to go to the upper deck before he turned back to me, all of his humor gone. Listen to old Captain Gunny, Shadow. If anything be happening to Gunny's crew or ship, he'll hunt you down till ye be dead or Gunny be. He only be doing this because Bottle Cap said Gunny had to go wherever ye say he did. I closed my eyes for a moment, then said slowly, We'll be in and out. You can take whatever you want, as long as it's not the items I need. I know the children of the night had a lot of priceless things. You can make a lot of caps with this. As long as Bunny, Gunny be alive, then he don't care much. And head up to the deck, too. Time for you to be earned in your keep. Gunny might have to go wherever you want him to go, but that don't mean you can be lazy, he said. Yes, sir, I said. He smiled a little. How many times does Gunny have to say it? I want a proper aye aye. I smiled back. Aye aye, Captain Gunny. And with that, I followed the captain up onto the deck. Soon we'd be heading to Canterlot, then to Aura. And that's if I lived through what was going to do. Aura, I hope you'll forgive me for making you wait a little bit longer. I'll see you soon, my love. I said into the night air, then headed up to Elliot and Sunspot as we turned the ship towards the small dot in the distance. Footnote. Level up. New perk added. Idiot savant. Duh. You spent too much time with Captain Gunny. Every once in a while, you'll have some moments where you're not the smartest, but you are the luckiest. With a plus one addition to your luck, you also have a chance to bank a critical hit in sats.